chairman of the Clare Roots Society. And uh, I think we convinced you after several years of discussions that it was worthwhile doing a DNA test, and now you won't put them down. So, <laughs> Patty has become a, a, an, an evangelist like um, many of us for genetic genealogy. And um, today, Patty is going to talk to us about uh, combining examples of the successful application of autosomal DNA matching from his own experiences and his thoughts on the statistical shortcomings of the current matching methodology. Um, examples will, will include how to use phasing and triangulation to either confirm or refute suspected relationships, often revealing unexpected double relationships. He will also demonstrate some tips and tricks for managing lists of DNA matches and will show how DNA matching interrelates with adoption and inheritance searches, marriage dispensations, bad record keeping, and other aspects of genealogical research. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome for Paddy Walter. Thank you, Morris. Uh, it didn't take Morris years to persuade me to do a test. I first had Morris talk to the Irish Genealogical Research Society in early 2013. And I came along here as a skeptic to Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2013, but Catherine Borges persuaded me to swab, and I did, and I've been hooped ever since. Uh, thank you all for coming, all my known relatives, all my DNA matches, friends, everyone else in the audience. Um, I have cobbled together some notes, including lots of examples that I may not have time to get through today, um, and I have put them on my own personal website, which is pwaldron.info. This is also hopefully being recorded with new technology on my own machine. Um, but if you go to pwaldron.info forward slash ggi2016, uppercase ggi, you should be able to read these notes yourself afterwards. Um, so a little bit about myself. I hope I don't look like I've been a genealogist since 40 years ago, but there are a few gray hairs appearing now. And I have rather a large database, which I have on a website, just to show you my own family tree on my TNG website. Um, doesn't quite fit on the screen. I'll show you the offline version in a moment. Uh, I encourage everybody, whether you're doing DNA or not, put your genealogy in an offline database. It works much faster, and it doesn't disappear, vaporize when you put it in the cloud and the company that you choose to rely on suddenly goes out of business, as has happened so many cloud computing businesses already. Um, so I enter my data in a program called Ancestral Quest, which is the successor to Personal Ancestral File, which was produced way back in the 80s by the Mormon Church. I've been using computers to store my genealogy database for practically 30 years now. Uh, there's my ancestry. I'll be talking quite a bit about my West Clare great-grandparents, McNamara and Clancy. I haven't had much success on my Waldron line with DNA. Um, my maternal line, as you can see, I have three Durkin great-grandparents out of four on my maternal side. They all lived in the same townland and there were eight other Durkin families in the townland. So that's quite a challenge for DNA as well. Um, while I have this up, let me show you what else I have done. In the notes for myself, I have put a tag up at the top, my get match kit numbers. I have done that for everybody in this database for whom I have found that they have done autosomal DNA. So I can search, and I did this earlier, it takes a little while to find out. I can say in the field selections, uh, define anybody where there's a get match tag in the notes. I actually have 456 of them in the database. How many of them are related to me? If I select my own direct ancestors and the number of descendant generations from those ancestors and say, OK, I have 13,316 people in the database who are my blood relatives. Most of those are now dead. Um, <laughs> but the combined count, I was astonished it had got to this size, 52 people I have found. That includes myself. It includes a Lazarus kit, which I tried to create for my late father, but 50 other people. I think it should say 53, because I found another on Thursday night. Um, so I'm astonished I have found those many no known relatives who've done autosomal DNA testing. So that's my genealogy background. Sorry, there I am. That's the one I want to go back to. Um, I'm also involved with Ireland Reaching Out, 
uh, as a volunteer administering the parish in West Clare that my grandmother was born in, my art of parish. This is the Ireland Reaching Out website. The idea of Ireland Reaching Out was we would reach out through this website to the diaspora around the world and they would ask queer questions and we'd answer them on the website. But if we scroll down to the message board, well, there was one this year and there was one last year. It's not very heavily used. But with the help of autosomal DNA, some of us, Michael O'Connell, who's here in the front row, and myself, nearly every week meet somebody who comes back to West Clare, having found their roots through autosomal DNA. In my professional life, I'm a mathematician. I have degrees in mathematical sciences, economics, finance. I've done a lot of statistics. I got rather annoyed at how poor the statistical rigor in analyzing autosomal DNA really seems to be. I know very little about genetics. I'm an entirely self-taught geneticist. So I'm up here waiting to be shot by those who know a lot more than me about it. But I'm on family tree DNA. I'm on GEDmatch. I'm on ancestry DNA. Um, I've shown you my tips and tricks with ancestral quest. I've become a project administrator. Uh, when Morris came down to Ennis in November of last year to give a talk to the Clare Root Society, of which I'm the chairperson, uh, we decided we would set up a Clare Roots <coughs> DNA project. So anybody who is here who has sent their DNA to Family Tree DNA and who has ancestors in County Clare, you're very welcome to join the Clare Roots project. Just follow that link and I'm logged in so you don't see a join button, but if you're not a member, you'll see a little button up there beside the, the ruin of the ancestral home in West Clare inviting you to join the project and just click that and I'll do my best to help you with your Clare Roots. Just out of curiosity, how many people here are project administrators at Family Tree DNA? And how many of you are residing in Ireland? Three, and myself, and Morris. So we really should get together a little more often and try and figure out what we can do as project administrators to help each other and to help our project members. I've also set up a Clancy surname project. As you saw, my great-grandmother was a Clancy. This is being organized in association with the 1916 commemoration. One of the leaders of the 1916 Rising who later died in the War of Independence was Pather Clancy from County Clare. And I always grew up understanding he was somehow related to me. So my hope for the Clancy project is to find somebody with an own relationship to Pather Clancy who will give me their DNA so that I confirm well, can confirm whether or not that's true. And I have a couple of suspects in Clare. But any male Clancy's in the room who are interested let me know. Um, so basically, this goes on night and day. We have people with clear roots in the Antipodes, New Zealand, over in California, west coast of the US. And we do this night and day. And it's like the financial markets. There's somebody working on a West Clare DNA problem all around the clock. So I said I would give a little bit of theory. Um, and then I'll come back to some examples, which will be a lot more entertaining, probably, than the theory. Hopefully, on day three of this conference, you all know that we all have 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes. And each chromosome we represent by a string of the letters A, C, G, and D, which represent different chemical compounds. I can just about drink with this mic on. Uh, in practice, we would, um, or in theory, we can see these long lists of letters. In practice, we can't actually unravel the paternal and maternal chromosome in each pair. We can just look in and we see pairs of letters. We might be an AC at one location, an AG at another location, and so on. Most of the locations in the chromosome were all identical. We're all A's, and most of the apes are probably A's as well. So for genealogy, we pick out the locations where it is known that within the human population, two or more different letters can be seen at that location. And they're called SNPs. The P stands for polymorphism. Not sure how many people here like me studied Greek in secondary school and know that poly means many and morph means shape. But in this case, poly doesn't really mean many. It means more than one. It's a location where within the human population we observe two different letters. And usually it's only two. They're called biallelic. Two different values can be seen. Um, and the problem with this is if you have somebody, you can only observe an AC. If I have an AC at location 123 and I want to compare myself with somebody else in the room, everybody else will either be an AC like me, an AA like me, 
or like not like me or a CC not like me. Um, I'm, I might have got the A from a common ancestor with either the AA or the AC, and I might have got my C from a common ancestor with the AC or the CC. But it doesn't re it's not really possible to tell anything about a common ancestor from a location where you have two different letters. So the interesting places are where I'm AA and the other person is also AA. We both definitely have an A which could have come from a common ancestor. We didn't know that before we compared ourselves. The other problem with this is, is that A an A that's shared by 99% of the population or an A that's only shared by 1% of the population? If Patrick here and I have an A or a double A in a location where only 1% of the population has an A, that's pretty significant. That tells us that there's something going on there. We might be related. But if we go to another location and we're both CCs, and that's a location where 99% of the population has a C, well, it's not really a whole lot of valuable additional information. So I wish we had better measurements of the significance of these strings of half-identical locations that we look at. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, I jump down. But all we really see is the number of locations that we have looked at where we cannot rule out the fact that we might have a common ancestor from whom we inherited one of the two letters we have. And the other length we have is the centimorgan length, which is basically an estimate of how far back the common ancestor might be. We have to work with those numbers. Mike Mulligan earlier, he said, we're looking for ideas for what ancestry could do to improve things. They can give us a chromosome browser, but a little more powerful chromosome browser um, than what we get from the other sites, which actually tell us within each half identical region, how many places are we, what I call mutually homozygous. And then within that, how rare or how frequent is the letter that we have at that location. Um, so a few rules of thumb for what to do with the technology that we have. Everybody who sends their DNA, be it to 23andMe, uh, Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, and the new Living DNA, which launched recently and has a stall downstairs, please copy your results to the third party getmatch.com DNA comparison website. It has far more powerful tools and useful tools than any of the websites of the companies that actually run the labs that extract the DNA from your DNA sample. If you have other DNA matches, please encourage and help them to copy their data to GetMatch. I've uploaded seven kits this week for different people, some of whom are down there in the audience who were struggling with it. It's become a lot, an awful lot easier than it was. Um, you do need a little bit of computer skill to save a file and upload a file. And it happens very fast. It used to take half an hour, and if you turned your back on it, it would crash, but now it's done in a minute or so. A lot of people talk to me about their DNA matches and their relatives, and they say third cousin, and I think, oh, you have a paper trail to this person, and you know you have common great-great-grandparents. Please distinguish when you're talking about the estimated third and fourth cousins and fifth cousins that you get from the DNA companies. There are very crude estimates. There's a very weak correlation once you go beyond about third cousin between the amount of DNA you share with a person and your actual genealogical relationship with that person. Um, I think it's commonly agreed that there are biases in the estimated relationships in the ancestry DNA estimated relationships. Most people find that the true relationship when they discover it is a little bit closer than the estimate. For the family tree DNA estimated relationships, most people find that the true relationship is further out than the estimated relationship. Um, so don't jump to the conclusion that those estimates are correct. So I like to concentrate on the bigger half-identical regions, as I call them. They're called blocks, segments, all sorts of other words, which I find a little bit misleading. Uh, when I first um, got my results back three years ago, I looked at my list of, I think it was about 400 matches at that stage, and I saw two names that I recognized, and I have no idea how I'm related to either of them. And in one case, I have a slightly better idea because of people who submitted DNA subsequently. The other is Jared Corcoran, who spoke earlier in the week, is down here in the front row. So I said, I just picked this as an example. 
Uh, and I want to show you how much noise there is in the total amount of shared DNA as well. So I set GetMatch to use the thresholds that Family Tree DNA uses when calculating total shared DNA, uh, 500 SNPs and one centimorgan. And we have all these tiny little ranges. Well, if you eyeball down along, you see down here, there's two numbers that stick out. On chromosome 10, there's a 13.3 with 3,773 SNPs. That's not there by chance. That's there because there's a common ancestor. Somewhere a way back, we have no idea. It could be seven or eight generations back, even at that level. All the rest is just statistical noise. You can ignore it. The other thing to look at in this one-to-one -one comparison, it's based on 677,571 SNPs because we were both tested with the same chip that looks in all the same locations in our DNA. Uh, Ancestry is now using a different chip from Family Tree DNA. 23andMe, I think, has always used a different chip. You will see there might be only 300,000 or 400,000 used in the comparison. So you won't have so much of these noisy uh, half-identical regions between 500 and 1,000, but you have a lot of noisy ones under 500 if you're looking at less. Also use the um, GetMatch Tier 1 facilities. Here's the GetMatch homepage. Um, when you register and log in, you see how many users are online. There was only 55 when I logged in earlier on. Um, do it early in the morning Irish time. The site gets busy and slow later in the day because most of the users are in the US and they're only getting up about now. We've been at it for hours. Uh, these are the free tools, the one-to-many matches and the one-to-one -one matches are the ones you use most often. But down at the bottom, you have these additional tier one utilities, and they're by far the most powerful and the ones I found the most helpful. And I encourage people to sign up at $10 a month, at least for one month for a trial subscription, see what you get out of them. And you sign up somewhere way down at the bottom, join tier one, or you can sign up and do a monthly offer renewal if you think it's gonna be worth it for the rest of your life. And if you're sure that the GetMatch website is going to be up and running, which has been very good recently. In the early days, it struggled, but they've made huge improvements. Uh, so if I go back uh, to the main page, the matching segment search, I have written some Excel macros to actually tidy these up. I encourage you, if you have any experience with Excel spreadsheets, they take a long time to run. Save the output in a spreadsheet, and you can add notes to the spreadsheet. So I did one earlier. Um, I can select that. I can copy it. I can go to my text editor. I can paste it. That gets rid of all the formatting. I can select it. I can copy it. And I can go back to Excel. And I can say on my personal menu, there's a thing there for matching segment search. Paste that. It runs a macro. It pastes it in. It filters the columns. Um, and I have even put over on the left-hand side a notes column where you can add notes about each match. So that helps you to be a lot more organized without using anything complicated. Um, I won't say that for now. I'll come back to that later. Um, if you want to use those um, macros, you can download them, and you might have to fiddle around with them a little bit. Or you can try and record a macro yourself. So ultimately, what we want to do with these things is phasing and triangulation. We each have 22 paternal chromosomes, 22 maternal chromosomes. If you see you have a half identical region with somebody you don't know on a particular chromosome, you don't know whether they match your paternal chromosome or your maternal chromosome. So you have to look for a third party where there's a known relationship on your paternal or maternal side, and they also match the stranger in the same region, and then you can say that's a paternal match or that's a maternal match. Uh, so let me go back to one that I opened earlier. This is my matching segment search. Here we are in chromosome 10. I match Thomas Miller and Mary Piazza in overlapping regions at the start of chromosome 10. I don't know whether they match each other or not. The next thing to do to see, do, do all three of us have a common ancestor, is take that kit number, copy it onto your clipboard. Take that kit number, copy it onto your clipboard. Go back to get match one-to-one -one comparison. One-to-one -one compare. 
This will probably say I've been logged out because I logged in an hour ago. Uh, so we'll go back and we'll log in again. That's the really annoying thing about GetMatch is it's very unstable in terms of logging you out if you use the back buttons or if you go away for a while. Um, so we'll go back in and go to a one-to-one -one compare. And I have this lovely little tool that I recommend everybody use because you'll be doing these double copy and paste all the time. Uh, it's called Ditto. It remembers everything that you had on your clipboard since you told it to start recording. And hopefully that will paste in the first number. Sorry, and then I tab down and I go back to Ditto and I go down to the second thing on the clipboard and I paste that in. And usually I say, in case it's just under the thresholds, we look at everything and I put in 501. And up comes where were we were. I matched this person. They match each other in chromosome one. I matched them on chromosome 10 at the start. They don't match each other at the start of chromosome 10. They both match me at the start of chromosome 10. That means one is related to my paternal chromosome, the other is related to my maternal chromosome. I don't know which is which, because I have no proven relationship to each of them. Another thing you'll find, yes, they do match each other, then you have what we call a triangulation group. Um, so we don't need that anymore, we'll come to that one later. A triangulation group is, uh, here's my definition of triangulation group. Here we are. Sorry, I went down too far. It's a group of three or more people, all of whom match the others on the same region of the same chromosome. Therefore, that region of that chromosome came down to everybody in the group from a single common ancestor. So let me look at another spreadsheet with a lovely group I put together, a group of people from County Clare. Um, some of whom I encouraged to swab myself, some of whom had done it already, some of whom were encouraged by various surname projects and clan gatherings. There's five people in this group, Bill, Carl, Oliver, Kevin and Ed. Bill and Carl live in America. I'm going to try and anonymize these things by referring to everyone by first, cousin, by first names for privacy reasons. Bill and Carl are in America, they're known first cousins. Ed is in North America somewhere, he's their known second cousin once removed. So that's one group of known relatives. Kevin and Oliver are in Clare. We know they're third cousins. We don't know how they're related to the other three. We know they have ancestral surnames in common. So here on chromosome 10 again, we have half identical regions, anything from three centimorgans up to 21 centimorgans between Bill and Ed from the American branch, and Oliver and Kevin from the County Clare branch. They all overlap. Some of us overlapping regions begin at 127 million something, others end at 128 million. In the case of Ed and Kevin, you would throw that out as noise normally. It's only three centimorgans, it's only 500 snips, but because it overlaps with known relatives, it's highly significant. So this tells us these four people, two from an American group, two from a Clare group, must have a common ancestor from whom some of them inherited 21 centimorgans, one of them only inherited three centimorgans, or two only inherited three centimorgans in common. Uh, the problem is the ancestral surnames. The group in America have two lines of Marinan ancestry and one line of Clancy ancestry. Oliver and Claire has one line of Marinan ancestry, one line of Clancy ancestry. Kevin and Claire has no Marinan ancestry. He has two lines of Clancy ancestry. But by looking at the occupations and the locations and the dates, it quickly became obvious there's a Clancy ancestor common to all five of these people. Um, they lived in roughly the same townland between Kilrush and Kilkee. The two Clancy's, the, the two brick wall Clancy ancestors were both born in the first decade of the 1800s. Uh, they both appear in the early parish records for Kilkee, which unfortunately were never microfilmed, having children in the 1830s and into the 1840s with the same townland address. So we're pretty certain they were brother and sister. One married a carpenter, the other had several sons who were carpenters, the female had sons who were carpenters, the male had a son-in-law who was carpenter, they all lived in the same towns. 
So I'm happy to say we have found a common ancestor for two groups of people who did not know they were related. And they're only fourth cousins, all done through DNA. So that was my first example. The second example is the one that I put in the title of the talk, the ups and downs. I put downs with an E because that's how the sur surname is spelled in Clare. Uh, I told Morris this story um, a year ago tomorrow, and he said, I'm booking you for next year for GGI 2016. You can tell that story, so I'd better tell it. It's a story that involves a couple of births out of wedlock, um, as a lot of stories in the world of DNA do. DNA has really left the genie out of the bottle as regar regards adoptions or any, any family secrets. Um, if you want to resolve those cases, if you want to meet the part of the family that was separated by adoption, DNA is the way to go. If you want to keep them secret, then don't put your DNA out in the public domain. So this was an amazing string of coincidences. I do an occasional professional genealogy job. I did an inheritance search for a man called Marnon, who had died in 2014. And I got to know his cousin, who was one of the heirs. And he said, oh, I have a pedigree of uh, my mother's side of the family. Would you like a copy? And he gave me this six A3 pages of the Downs family of West Clare. And some of them were distant cousins of mine through other lines. So I was very happy to have it. Uh, last year, within a short number of weeks, the 10th of June, I, I checked the post on Facebook. Uh, the Clare Roots Society was approached by a man who'd got a 50th birthday present from his wife of his first ever trip to Ireland to visit where his grandfather was born. And um, I forget, was it his, his grandfather, I think, actually died on a visit home to Ireland. Um, that was the famous story of the man who was late for his own funeral. One of the very early cases where a man was flown from Clare to America to be buried in America, and the funeral was all set and the plane was delayed. And, uh, I think the funeral had to go ahead and he arrived halfway through or something. Um, but anyway, nine days after that, I went to get match to check my one to many match list to see had I any new matches. And um, this lady called Dana Downs showed up with the biggest half identical region I had seen so far without a, with a stranger, 44.6 centimorgans and chromosome 12. And I said, she has to be closely related with something that big. I found a few bigger ones that I haven't managed to explain since then, so I sent her an email straight away. And it took about two days before I got an invitation to her family tree and ancestry, uh, which was three quarters very complete, but with a big blank. Um, the 8th of July, about three weeks later, I get an email from somebody else who found me on GetMatch, Bill Brown. He matched my first cousin on the Mayo side, nothing to do with the Clare side of the family, but a small match. 10.3 centimorgans. And I said, why is he even bothering me about a small match like that? That's so far back, we'll never find the common ancestor. But I looked at his one-to-many match list, and here he was with Dana, who had contacted me a few weeks before. Two very big half-identical regions, 30 centimorgans and 19 centimorgans. And I said, this guy's even more closely related to Dana than I am. And eventually, we put our heads together, we worked out the family tree, these three people who'd made contact with me within less than a month were descended from immigrants called Downs, who'd all emigrated from the same house in Clare. Uh, two of them had gone to DNA because they had brick walls, because there was a birth out, out of wedlock. Um, but we quickly worked out Bill and Dana are double third cousins once removed. And um, my Clancy ancestors and their Downs ancestors were near neighbours. So to look back at Dana's story, her grandfather was her brick wall. She knew his parents' names. He had come from New York City to Texas on what they called an orphan train from a foundling asylum in New York City at the age of about four or five in 1904 and 1905 to foster parents, with whom he lived very happily. And they did well. They were German immigrants. And in the 1920s, they wanted to go back to Germany. And they wanted to bring their son, their foster son, there was no legal adoption at the time, and they had to get him a passport. So there's a big file in the Ancestry passport applications of why should we give a passport to this guy who doesn't know who he is. He came with the names of his parents, but he certainly wasn't the child of the people who were trying to bring him to Germany as their son. The parents were Henry Clancy and Catherine Downs. 
I have a Henry Clancy, my great grandmother's first cousin in my family tree. He married a Catherine Downs. So I said, I didn't know they had a son. So we went and we did a little bit of research and we found that Catherine Downs emigrated on the Teutonic, the end of 1899. She's here on line 22. Cath Downs, aged 18, a servant from Querin. Funny little Q. Querin is usually spelled with a double R, but only one R. Bound for New York. Her fare was paid by her cousin. Don't know yet who the cousin was, but the address is given there, 518 Lexington Avenue, New York. Uh, then the next question is, when did Henry emigrate? Henry sailed on the last day of the 1800s on the Lucania. By coincidence, he's also line 22. Handwriting isn't great. Ancestry transcribed it as H-E-W-R-Y, so we had to be a little clever with wild cards to find him. He's 22, male, single, um, not sure what that says. Birthplace is given as Kilrush, which is the major town about eight or ten miles away from where he was born. He wasn't born in the town. He changed his destination. I think that scroll says Terre Haute, Indiana, because that's where they ended up. Paid his own passage. He was going to his cousin, somebody Healy in Terre Haute, Indiana. I still haven't figured out how he was related to the Healy's or the Haley's as they're spelled on the census. Uh, so what next? Raymond is born um, in January 1900. We find him in the New York Foundling Asylum. Sorry, I should have looked at the line number, line 72 I want to zoom in, which is there. There he is, Raymond Downs. Uh, white male, January 1900, I think that says aged four twelfths or something. Uh, those columns are all dittos, unknown, place of birth unknown, place of birth of father unknown, place of birth of mother unknown. But I have no doubt that Raymond Downs, born in January 1900, was conceived in County Clare. By the time he was born, both of his parents had gone to New York. And the New York Foundling Asylum was essentially serving the role of the mother and baby home for County Clare at that stage. Where was Kate Downs in 1900? She's in the census the same week in the same institution as her baby, but enumerated on a different page. Uh, line 91 down at the bottom here. Downs Kate, white female, born May 1880, age 20, single, I got this bit wrong, born in New York to New York parents. Uh, she was a nurse. And I think it's too much of a coincidence that there was a baby whose mother was Kate Downs in this asylum and there was an adult called Kate Downs in the same asylum on the same date. And she was probably working for her keep. Where was Harry? What had the father done? Well, he deserted her and he'd gone to Indiana. And again, I forgot to check my line number, line 68. Um, at the top of the page. This is almost impossible to read. I don't know how we found it. Clancy Harry. He now changed from Henry to Hurry to Harry. A boarder in whose house? The Haley's. The same people he was going to on the passenger list. April 1874, age 26, born in Ireland. Parents born in Ireland. Immigrated only six months ago. An alien, a car blacksmith. So that was the family split up in 1900. But I had always known that Henry had come back from Indiana to New York City to marry the next door neighbor from home in 1904. So they obviously kept in contact. Uh, it wasn't a complete breakdown. And they seemed to have had a happy life together in Terre Haute, where they had one more daughter born in 1905. She never married. The family has died out. I don't know whether she ever knew that she had a full brother who'd gone to Texas. But now through DNA, I'm in contact with my fourth cousin, our most recent common ancestors, are Hugh Clancy and Marcella Blackall. We lived in Callard, the same townland that Henry and Catherine were born in. Time is getting short, so I'm going to skip through some of the more technical examples. Um, just show you some of the basis. This is another one I said you often find a double relationship. Uh, this is a case where we found a triangulation involving Somebody who did DNA, somebody he knew was a cousin on his father's side, somebody who knew was a cousin on his mother's side. Um, 
Michael and Martin have 32 centimorgans. Martin is the cousin on the mother's side. Anne is the cousin on the father's side. They share 11 centimorgans on the same part of chromosome 4. And Michael and his paternal cousin Anne share 8 centimorgans. So why do we match up with a paternal and a maternal cousin in the same part of the same chromosome? There must be a double relationship. So we ran another of the tools on uh, GetMatch. There's it gone here. Are your parents related? And we came up with on chromosome 1, Michael's maternal chromosome 1 and his paternal chromosome 1 matched each other for 23 centimorgans. His parents probably didn't know they were related. They may only be fourth or fifth or sixth cousins, but the DNA revealed it. So you'll often get these little puzzles. Next example, I love this one. Um, this is one of my Californian members of the Clare Roots Project said, can you get me DNA from some of my fourth cousins at home in Clare? He might have third cousins, we haven't traced any, we've traced fourth cousins. Um, and the oral tradition that I took down years ago from one of my County Clare informants, who sadly is long departed, who had a brilliant memory for family history, was that there was a farm that belonged to an OD man, and he had two daughters, and one married a Connell, and one married a Lynch, and he divided the farm up between them. And I actually confirmed that in the Tide the Plotment book, where I find Michael Lynch and Pat Connell living right beside each other. So we got DNA from Claire, who's descended from, her mother was a Lynch, and on the DNA databases, we found a man called Ed, whose mother was an O'Connell, descendants of the same house, the same farm that was divided up in 1820. And they're fourth cousins, according to the family tree, but they have this huge 50 centimorgan match. So we know that 50 centimorgan match shared by the two fourth cousins, descended from the two OD sisters, must have come down from those two OD sisters born well, married around 1820, born around 1800. So we're going back into the 1700s practically here. So we look to see, did anybody else match Claire and Ed on this region where they match each other? And anybody who did must be related either um, to the original Mr. O.D. or his wife, whose surname we don't know. And we found this gentleman called Michael, and he matched both of them. Uh, between 17 million and 38 million on chromosome 8, so bang in the middle, for 26 or 27 centimorgans. And his name is Lynch. So we can be pretty sure from the DNA that he's descended from the OD couple. And because his surname is Lynch, we can be pretty sure that he's descended from the daughter who married the Lynch, not any of the other children. All he knew was that his grandfather was Eugene Lynch, born somewhere in Ireland, somewhere around 1869. We can now tell him, thanks to DNA, this is the townland and this is the farm that your Lynch ancestor came from. So Michael and his three siblings are coming over next month to Moveen to meet the cousins that they found through DNA. A few more adoption cases. My top match three years ago when I first got my results was a lady called Anthea in England. She was up, adopted as far back as 1938 in pretty horrendous circumstances, which I probably shouldn't go into. Uh, I've been working as hard as I can with her to find out, she was abandoned as a baby basically, to find out who abandoned her and who were her parents. And three years hard work later we've got as far as we think we have found some second cousins for her. Three people are all descended from the same great grandparents, they're almost certainly two of Anthea's eight great grandparents. Uh, there's a long way to go to find the other six, there's a long way to go to find out which child or grandchild of the identified couple were her grandparents and her parents. Sometimes it's very easy. The next one was just ridiculously easy. Another of the active members of the Clare Roots Project lives in the Antipodes, we'll say. And again, he said to me, can you find me a, a fourth cousin in Clare that will provide a DNA sample? So I showed up, he said, I'm paying. I said, this gentleman is a bit tight with money. Uh, we really should try and make him pay. And he said, no, no, no. Um, so I got his DNA, we sent it back, results came back, uploaded to GetMatch. His top match was, turned out to be an adoptee looking for her birth parents. It took me less than an hour to tell her who her birth parents were. Um, so I haven't gone public on that story yet, so I don't want to say anything more about it. Um, 
Another story, a more complicated adoption story here in Ireland. My fifth cousin was adopted. I found him and his son through the DNA websites and we compared notes and things just weren't adding up. The information, the adoption agency, he was going through the adoption agency to try and unite the adoptee with the, the birth family. Uh, there were half siblings out there. And at the same time, he was working with the DNA information to see what he could find out if he didn't have the information from the adoption agency. And things just weren't adding up. And eventually, through DNA, he met somebody who's here in this room who was able to tell him, I know all the gossip from that area. This is what happened. This girl got in trouble with this guy, and that's where your father came from. And it fitted perfectly with the DNA evidence. So eventually, the adoption agency came back and said, Oops, we got our files confused. We gave you the wrong information and produced a file which exactly tallied what had come up through the DNA and through the local gossip network. And of course, everybody knew the story in the locality except the half siblings, which is usually the case. <laughs> this is another one that I've given several talks about before, but again, DNA came to the rescue. Uh, there was an inheritance case back in the 1920s where a man called T.J. Talty died in Florida, leaving what became known as the Talty Millions. It was never millions. It was right before the 1929 crash, so it was a lot less than millions by the time it was distributed, and a lot less, again, with apologies to the lawyers in the room, by the time the lawyers had taken their cut out of the store, <laughs> the estate. But ultimately, various hearings were heard, and all the old people were interviewed, and the family trees were put together, and it was decided that the nearest next of kin of T.J. Talty, who died in Florida, were his first cousins scattered around the world. My great-grandfather was one of them, and they got some few pounds, quite a few pounds by the standards of the time, several hundred pounds each. And back, I've always been interested in this story, and back in 2007, I found a girl in Australia, Christiane, asking questions about her ancestor, Mary Talty, T.J. Talty was the son of a Timothy Talty and a Margaret McNamara. He emigrated with his parents to Lowell, Massachusetts when he was a teenager. Um, what's going on here? Uh, this is the marriage certificate that Christiane found for her Talty ancestor, bottom one on the page. Marriage in 1868 in Sandhurst in Victoria. Donald McCaskill married Mary Talty, bachelor, spinster. He was from Scotland. She was from Milltown, Malbay, County Clare. Uh, 25 and 22, living in Kerrang in Victoria. Her parents were Timothy Talty and Margaret McNamara, and he was a storekeeper. So I scratched my head and said, could there really be two families with such an unusual combination of names? And my cousin found a file in the attic with all the papers from the inheritance case, and one document said the Taltys had a farm in the townland of Knock and Alban, and they also had a shop in the town of Milltown Mulbay, and they moved back and forth between the two, and some children were baptized in one parish, and some were baptized in the other parish. And I said, I think the wrong heirs got the money, because if there was a sister in Australia with a dynasty of descendants, they were closer related than the first cousins. So Christiane eventually sent in her DNA, and we compared it with myself and my first cousin, Anthony, who's down there somewhere. And in her top four matches, when we sort them by longest block, were Anthony and myself. So uh, no doubt now the wrong heir has got the money, and the Christiane is our fourth cousin twice removed. We all match on chromosome 9 between 85 million and 103 million. And this is what shattered my faith in the ethnicity estimates that we get. She has her two, two of her four top matches are 100% British Isles, according to Family Tree DNA. Christiane is an amalgam of many different nationalities, 47% Eastern Europe, 43% Western and Central Europe, 7% Finland and Northern Siberia, 3% Asian Minor, no mention of British Isles. So your relative matches can have completely different ethnicity estimates from your own ethnicity estimates. And again, there's a double relationship there, which I don't have time to go into. But the DNA doesn't always tell the truth, or at least you can twist the DNA to tell stories that come out not to be the truth. And my paternal grandfather had a cat ancestor from East Clare, from Six Mile Bridge. And there's a cat family that I know in West Clare around Kilkee. 
So this man called Joe showed up as a match to me. I knew his mother, who was a cat, and we matched for 10 and a half centimorgans and chromosome 18. And I knew his cats were in West Clare for umpteen generations back, mine were in East Clare. So if there was any relationship, it was going to be quite distant, and this was all we might expect. And cat was our only common surname. So I said, great. And there's actually another little bit of evidence from traditional genealogy. There was a famous lady called Georgina Frost who took a case for her right as a woman to be a clerk of Petty Sessions all the way to the House of Lords in the 1910s up to 1920 and got the law changed. And she was elected by the local magistrates to the position of clerk of Petty Sessions three times. And the nomination was sent to Dublin Castle who sent it back and said, this isn't good enough, you can't elect a woman, have another election. And they elected her again and again and eventually she got her job. But one of the magistrates who elected her was the chairman of the county council, who ex officio was a magistrate, and he was none other than Joseph Kelly Kett, the grandfather after whom my DNA match Joe was named. So I always wondered, was this the local politician making a stand for women's rights, or was this the cousin from West Clare supporting the cousin from East Clare? And I said, well, it must be the latter, because we have this little DNA match. And then I went to... JJ, who happens to be Joe's fourth cousin, also descended by the, from the Kets, and he wanted help with his family tree. And I said, I'll help you if you give me your DNA, and we sent it off. And back it came, and here we have a little overlap, chromosome 18 again. Um, only 6.4 centimorgans for all three of us match. So that definitely says these two have common ancestors, um, John Kett and Mary O'Connell. They match each other, they match me in the same region. Surely I'm related to John Kett or Mary O'Connell. Case proved. Then I got another cousin. Um, this was another one for the man in California wanted DNA from the cousin in Fair, and I facilitated it. And I looked at her results, and here we are in chromosome 18 again, uh, between 10 million and 12 million. She matches Joe, the man with the cat mother, me, the man with the cat, great-great-great-grandfather, JJ, the other man with the cat ancestor. But she's related to me, not through my grandfather, through whom my cat DNA should come, but through my grandmother. So there's some other common ancestor back there through whom we all inherited this little segment in chromosome 18. Uh, and another similar case, Kevin is my fourth cousin. Our common great-great-great-grandmother is Mary O'Connor. I found Kevin had a match with a man called Tom Comer, not a very common name. And I had been in correspondence with a man called Tom Comer, who had relations in West Clare. The West, back near Loophead Peninsula, anywhere further west than where you are in West Clare, is known as the West. Um, so I said, this is great, looked at Tom's tree. Oh, he has an O'Connor ancestor as well. The O'Connor ancestor married a man from the West. Um, they went to Sandy Hook in Connecticut, where half of West Clare emigrated back in the... 19th century. So I wrote to Tom, or wrote to the person who was managing Tom's DNA kit and said, I think we have a connection through the O'Connors. Reply came back, no, this is a different Tom Comer. <laughs> Turned out he was related to Kevin on the other side of Kevin's family. Uh, you want to shut me up? Yeah. Um, which of the... Okay, just for, just for Cindy. Uh, a surname that came into some of those double matches that I skipped earlier was the Marinan family. Uh, my cousin Cindy down there has been adopted as the genealogist of the Marinan family. It's like Talty, it's a name that there's about 300 of them in the census returns. Every single one is from County Clare. If you're not from County Clare, you've probably never heard of these surnames. There's other names like Considine and Conhedi, where you immediately know they're from County Clare. Um, the homeland is supposed to be a townland called Curragh O'Dee. Michal Marnan is a great traditional musician. He's written a song called Between Milltown and Sweet Ennis Diamond because he was so caught up of explaining where Curragh O'Dee was. Um, and there are other branches further south, down towards Kilrush area, townlands of Shra and Kilmacduan. And I talked to another great musician who's a Marnan descendant. There's an, obviously a musical gene in the family. And he said, well, we always heard nine brothers left after the famine and came south, two or three parishes south, uh, Tertstra and Kilmacduan. I'm not sure which famine he was talking about. It may be the 1740 famine rather than the 1845 famine, because by Griffith's valuation in 1855, there's already about seven Marinan families in Shra. Um, 
but we can find remarkably large segments of DNA which persist through many, many generations. Megan and Theresa are both Maryland descendants. One is from the townland of Shra. Well, they're both in America, but one's ancestor can be traced back to Shra, to a Peter Marnon. The other can be traced back to a completely different Peter Marnon in Kilmock Duan. They're not the same man. They're both called Peter. They're obviously not brothers. They may be first cousins or uncle and nephew or something. These two ladies are no closer than sixth cousins, but they have a 69.5 centimorgan segment of shared DNA at that distance. We're pretty sure that it's not from any more recent common ancestor that it has come down through the Marinans, maybe all the way back to Curricode D before the 1740 famine, for all we know. Um, I'll show you this matrix. This is the Reedy dynasty. <coughs> this is a comparison matrix from Deadmatch. Everybody except the person in the first row and the first column is a proven descendant of a Michael Reedy and a Margaret Maloney who lived in Tully Crime between Ennis and Kilrush and County Clare. I was going to ask you who's the odd one out, and I told you who's the odd one out. Uh, the one in the first row and the first column is in New Zealand. Um, she has a death certificate for her emigrant ancestor, Daniel Reedy, which says his father was another Daniel Reedy, and his mother was a Margaret Maloney, presumably another Margaret Maloney. Um, I don't think looking at those numbers that we're looking at somebody who is more distantly related to everybody in the inner columns than they are to each other. I think the death certificate is wrong and that the father was Michael and that she's from the same family. But that just shows you how many people we now have for couples who lived in the mid 1800s on the DNA database. Some of those I recruited, uh, some of them recruited each other. Some of them we just found as DNA matches and were able to give them a couple of extra generations back to the common ancestor. And skip the marriage dispensation stories. DNA is a bit like the marriage dispensation. Uh, anybody who's gone through Irish Catholic marriage registers will see obtenta dispensazione in porto et quarto grado consanguinitate, etc. Um, so you know you have two ancestors who were third cousins who married each other. But where's the piece of paper that sets out the family tree telling us who was the common ancestor of the two third cousins who wanted to marry? It's a bit like DNA. You're just scratching your head and wondering, is there a document somewhere in a diocesan archive that will tell me these details? And just to show why faith and ethnicity has been completely restored since I started recruiting people in West Clare, I can now tell you by looking at a list of DNA matches, that person's 100% West Clare. I got a result for a man during the week. Um, we don't have much of a family tree for he's in his 80s and his great-grandparents were all married before civil registration. I looked through the top 30 matches, the first page of family tree DNA matches. There were seven people that morning that I knew and I had an appointment to meet another of them visiting from America that evening, so that made eight. Six of them were people I swabbed myself, got their DNA myself. But only one of them is a man that's a known relative of the person whose DNA results have come in. We still have to figure out exactly who the common ancestor is with the other seven, but they're all West Clare DNA. And I did these calculations some time ago, <laughs> um, worked out from the population of Ireland 12 generations back and a uh, little bit of statistics. I think any two Irish people have a 95% chance of being 12th cousins or closer. I think if you narrow it down to a county like County Clare, there's a 95% chance we're ninth cousins or closer. If you narrow it down to a little narrow area like an island or like the Lupet Peninsula, everybody married somebody from within 10 miles, and most of that 10 mile radius is either the Shannon Estuary or the Atlantic Ocean. There was a very small pool to choose from. I think we're probably all fifth or sixth cousins or closer. There's even one lady in the Clare Roots project um, who, when I looked at her matches with other people within the project, when that worked, the advanced matching has been broken on family tree DNA for weeks. She matched more than 10% of the people within the Clare Roots project. In theory, we're only supposed to match about 10% of our fifth cousins. So I think the inference is she's closer on average than fifth cousin to everyone else in Clare. And there's a great story um, that Mark Humphreys of Dublin City University came and, and talked about in Killaloo for the millennium of the Battle of Clontarf a couple of years ago. We're all descended from Brian Baru. We had the male line representative here for the first two days, Conor O'Brien, the present Lord in Chiquin, 
Um, but if you think back 30 generations, 10 generations back, you have a thousand ancestors in your family tree. Another 10 generations back, each of those is a thousand. That's a million slots to fill. 30 generations back to Brian Baru, another thousand each. That's a billion slots to fill in your family tree. There's going to be a lot of repetition. Anybody who was around 30 generations back and has descendants today is an ancestor of everyone today. So DNA may just be telling us a little bit more than what we know anyway. We're all related. We all have common ancestors. Great. And if Thanks, you want Martin. any further reading, there's a link there at the bottom to my general document on everything I've learned about DNA in the last three years. And where will this be? This will be on your website. This document is on my website, pwaldron.info forward slash uppercase GGI 2016. Now, um, Paddy, you'll be around for the rest of the day, so if you I'll have be questions for Paddy, then please do come up and ask them. Unfortunately, we're a little bit over time, so uh, we're going to go on to the next presentation in the next two minutes. But uh, thanks, Paddy, for a wonderful presentation, and it's great to see West Clare being connected genetically in ways that we probably never imagined about three or four years ago, so thanks very much. Thank you.